I had seriously considered doing a jingle for today's ad for the podcast and then made the decision based off the fact that I can't sing and I don't have any rhyme. Anyways, today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Clean Cut Meals. Clean Cut Meals are a professional meal prep service and have various plans to suit your specific goals. They change up their menus every week so that you never get bored and can help you stay on track long term. I've been using the lads for... Man, nearly a year now. I used them back for my six back-to-back marathons in the Sahara Desert, and I've been using them every day for my post-workout meal in the lead-up to next year's endurance events. So if you're short on time or looking to get the time back from shopping, cooking, preparing, and clean, cleaning up after meals, then I can't recommend them more. To get 20% off your first-time order, go to cleancutmeals.ie and enter the podcast code BKF at the checkout. That's BKF as in Brian Keen Fitness at the checkout for 20% off all first time orders if you have any other questions just fire the lads over an email and now on to this week's episode cue the music Tommy holy fuck is all I can say I gotta stop swearing I'm just two seconds in anyways that's the only words I can use to describe today's episode it's this is one of these episodes that I got completely lost in the conversation. Um, John Joseph McGowan, he's a punk rock legend, nine times Ironman athlete, um, a fully plant-based. And on the surface of that description, you're like, oh, cool, talk a little bit of Ironman training, a little bit of plant-based. No, <laughs> not at all. John Joseph was raised in foster care and grew up basically on the streets of New York. He has been physically abused, sexually abused, traveled the world as a drug dealer, Got was a drug addict, was locked up in maximum security prisons, has had KOSs on him, kill on sites from top drug dealers in New York. His life is like a movie. It's unbelievable. I actually first heard of him on the Joe Rogan podcast. So he was on Joe Rogan recently, um, and I heard a story, and then I, I reached out to him and was like, man, can, pl- can we please connect and get you to tell your story on my podcast, because it's just unbelievable. Um, there, there's no words to describe this. This episode is, it's like listening to a movie, when he talks about his you know, having shots fired at his head, being how he got out of locked up when he was on transitioning from one boat to another to from maximum security prisons, his life as a drug dealer or l- drug dealing to some of the top celebrities in the world, such as Dave Chappelle. He, his, his life is just amazing. I guess there's nothing else I can really say. Um, and I'm just going to cut this intro short because this is a must listen. This is... This is an unbelievable episode. His new book, The PMA Effect, is out this week. Um, and we talk a little bit about Ironman, which is, for those of you unfamiliar, is a four-kilometer swim, 4.8-kilometer swim. I've got my first Ironman next year. Um, it's a, ooh, what's the distance? 180-kilometer cycle and a marathon to finish. Um, you know, you really should have checked that before I came on. I'm training for that right now. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, I'm just going to get straight into this one because holy fuck is the only word I can use to describe this. Some of you may have listened to him on Joe Rogan. Uh, some of you may have listened to John Joseph on the Rich Roll podcast. Um, and without further ado, here he is for the Brian King Fitness audience. This is one of my favorite episodes. This is just unbelievable. Um, enjoy. John Joseph McGowan. You're listening to the Brian Keane Fitness Podcast, where Irish fitness entrepreneur Brian Keane answers your questions and interviews leaders in the world of fitness, health, mindset, and natural wellness. Come join the fun. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Brian Keane Fitness Podcast, where we talk everything health, nutrition, and fitness to help you with your goals. Today's guest, I am so excited to have been able to overlap with. John Joseph McGowan, the punk rock legend, is a nine times Ironman athlete who is fully plant-based and he is the voice of the American hardcore punk rock band, the Cro-Mags. 
He is also the author of the great books, The Evolution of a Cro-Magnon, where he talks about growing up on the mean streets of New York. And his second book, Meat is for Pussies, a how-to guide for dudes who want to get fit, kick ass and take names, is where he offers both personal and scientific evidence that is plant-based diet or that a plant-based diet offers the best path to athleticism, endurance, strength and overall health. John Joseph was raised in foster care and grew up on the streets of New York and has one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard. The son of an alcoholic prize fighter and an abused mother, John was removed from his family at the age of five, spent years in one of the New York State's worst foster homes, which is eventually was shut down, and ended up at various violent boys' homes and institutions. Through his upbringing and life experiences, he tackles all of life's challenges through PMA, positive mental attitude, and his new book, The PMA Effect, How a Positive Mental Attitude Can Make You the Badass You Were Born to Be, came out this week, and the link will be in the show notes. He has been described as the world's toughest vegan and wellness guru, and I cannot wait to delve into all things John Joseph, fitness, and positive mental attitude. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me, lad. Yeah, John, I don't even know where to start. As I mentioned in the introduction, you've one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard, but can you tell everybody listening a little bit more about yourself and your backstory? Um... Yeah, I mean, it's it was it was a rough uh, it was a rough uh, rough beginning. I mean, uh, like like you said, you know, my father was a professional boxer. He he, uh, he fought over at the Gramercy Gym with Customato. I mean, he he had uh, you know a, a bunch of amateur fights and pro fights, and then he started drinking and uh, getting violent and. You know, he was not a nice person, and the, the family hails from uh, Donegal, Ireland. And um, you know, he—he, he, uh, I didn't find out till I was forty years old. My mother had this secret that uh, she was actually raped by him, and uh, that's how uh, I was conceived. There's a, actually a picture in my book of him holding me coming home from the hospital, and if you look at that picture, you'll see that. Uh, my older brother of one year was hiding behind my mother, terrified of him because he actually was beating her the the entire time that she was pregnant with me. And, uh, and then two years later, he raped my mother again after she left him. And, um, that's how my younger brother was conceived. So, um, you know, I always say you know, my, my journey started even in the womb because uh, of of the circumstances. And, you know, no one can understand when it comes to a woman um, being battered and abused how, how, you know, she was a young, a, a young woman, 18, 19 years old. By the time she was 21, she had three kids by this maniac. And the police wouldn't press charges against him. Nobody believed her. The family didn't help her. So who do you turn to? You know, so um, eventually, and it, like I said in my book, it's the last memory I have of him. And it was the night uh, he, she had been on the run uh, hiding from him with three kids. And previously, you know, my mother told me all this stuff later on, like, you know, he would he would track her down and, and and beat the crap out of her and take any money from her that she had um, to feed us or anything. I mean, she had to take him to court to get him to pay uh, to, for his kids, and then um, you know he would he would give her the money so it was uh, cleared through the court, and then he would you know break in and take the money from her and beat the crap out of her. So this is what my life uh, was um, coming into this world. And then finally, that fateful night, uh, I just remember him breaking in and, and, and being terrified and, uh, you know, him beating the crap out of her all over the house and breaking lamps. And, 
and and being in this police car and they took us away and and, and put us into an orphanage first and then um from there, uh, you know, I always had a little resentment towards my older brother because it was like the family told her to get abortions for, for, for me and my younger brother. And the only one that got taken in when that happened, uh, my older brother was taken in uh, by my grandparents, by, by my mother's. And, and me and my younger brother had to go to an orphanage and then get put in a foster home and the thing was uh, eventually it was too much for my mother to even take care of uh, my grandparents to take care of um, my older brother and then he was also put in foster care and the home that he was in before he joined me and my brother um, the person was only taking young uh, orphans from Vietnam girls uh, and it turned out that he was raping the girls and that house got shut down and then they put him in my older brother in with us and uh, it was you know this house was insane man they 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 you know a lot of shit went on in there I talk about it in my book the evolution of a crow magnum but uh you know it, it's and and this thought hit me you know, so many years later, for the seven years that I was in that house, they never took one single photo of us. There's not even one single photo that they took of us. And they made us sleep in the garage and we weren't allowed in the house. We were basically their slaves. They got money for taking care of us. They fed us dog food, uh, Oreo spit sandwiches, she would scrape the filling off and spit it in a bowl and, and wipe it on green molded bread. And that was what we were fed. And, you know, they tried to pit us against each other like we would be starving. And if you uh, snitched uh, on, on anything that anybody else was doing, then you got to pick the box of cereal that and eat it in front of all the other kids. I mean, it was just... They were fucking animals, man, and and uh, the father beat the crap out of us constantly, and uh, you know we were uh, you know sexually abused by by the older uh, foster kids that were in the home that were you know seventeen and eighteen and and threatening us, and um, you know we started to fight back. Um, by we found out where the money was that they were stashing because you couldn't put it in the bank. You were supposed to be spending it, and and then we started, you know, stealing from them. And, um, you know, the thing was, my mother kept telling us that we were gonna come home, but she had a boyfriend that didn't want us around. So it was like, you know, we couldn't say anything to her about what was going on because my mother tried to commit suicide uh, on one visit where we we were like kind of even hinted that what was going on and we want to get out of there and how long are you going to leave us in this home and because you know after like years she she took us for home visits um for the weekend and uh, so we never said anything we just kept uh, we kept a diary uh, of, of everything they did to us and uh, after a while, you know, we turned, we realized we weren't going home. And my mother even said to this day, I'm so sorry that I chose my boyfriend over my kids. And uh, from there, uh, we handed in the diary and the state closed the house down. They took all the foster kids out and then we just got bounced around to different homes. And I ended up in St. John's Home for Boys and uh, that didn't go well in Rockaway Beach. But I started meeting amazing people. Like I would see the Ramones out there, and you know, and all these punk rock uh, people, and and um, you know, it was as much insanity that went on. I was there from '76 for the bicentennial of America, and and uh, some crazy shit happened. The the locals were all Irish, fucking. They called they called uh, Rockaway Beach the the Irish Riviera because it was all the shanty Irish, <laughs> you know, serious shit lived out there and they were they would beat up the kids from the home 
when they went uh, off the property, and uh, we got the repercussions of that because me and my brother were the only white kids in that home. And and, then one fourth of July, they threw Molotov cocktails during the, you know, it was funny because I was like this white kid, but I I, I swore I was black and and I bought black clothes and fucking hung with the homies and fucking thought everything was cool. But uh, when they threw the Molotov cocktails and hurt those kids, they, I got jumped, you know, and, and then, that's when I was like, all right, I realized then I'm not, I'm not one of them. Uh, you know, it's, uh, so then, um, I started hanging out with this, this maniac that was in there named, uh, Bobby K and, and, uh, his, his, uh, mother's boyfriend when he was young, uh, he woke his mother's boyfriend up and, uh, he, he threw him in the bathtub with, with, uh, lighter fluid and set him on fire and and burned him from the neck down completely and and but he ended up being like this five nine two hundred and forty pound fucking wall of steel that was just in mental institutions and fucking insane and my first acid trip he tried to murder me and uh you know so i i actually ended up leaving the home and going on the streets and trafficking drugs and then uh, you know, got locked up, uh, in 78 and, and I had to serve two years in, 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 uh, you know, like the worst facilities you can imagine in, in New York state for 21 and under at that time, which was JV, um, Spofford and Lincolndale. And, um, you know, I was just very confused, very angry, uh, in Spofford, I was the only white kid. I was the target. The cops were from the cops were Irish who took me up there from Central Book and then they, they, they basically said the first motherfuckers that fuck with you in there, you better take them out because the last white kid that was up there, you know, got stabbed and left in a body bag, uh, left the facility in a body bag. So like to tell me that kind of shit and I always knew Spofford was a terrible place, but it was, I was basically fighting from the first day I hit the unit, uh, B3, I was, I was fighting. So, uh, you know, it, it was just, um, a very confusing time in my life. I didn't know why I was going through all this shit. You know, what did I do? Um, you know, and very, like I said, very angry and I became uh, adept at fighting, <laughs> very good at fighting, as a matter of fact, because when you, you know, they have a saying, when when you get locked up, you better get your weight up. So I went in there 135 pounds, and after two years, I was 165. I could box. I could fight. I was a good athlete, and, uh, you know, I went out, uh, and they released me back onto the street, and I, to my mother, of all things, which I didn't even have a relationship really with her, and that didn't work out. And I went back out, started selling drugs, and I caught another case. And then they offered me the Navy or the military or jail. So as I always say, the state didn't raise no fool. I went into the military. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got I, I started doing the same thing. I found ways to I was smuggling drugs in the military uh, on the ship because there's no dogs, there's no customs, there's no nothing. Uh, and if you pay off the man, I was paying people off to know when the dogs were coming on the ship because every once in a while they would bring the dogs aboard. So I had to get all my shit off the ship before the dogs came on. Um, and, uh, I caught a case in Norfolk, which, um, you know, I sold drugs to an undercover. I was selling LSD. I was selling all kinds of shit, fucking pills, weed, and, um, I caught a case and then I was uh, being processed for that, but it was a civilian case. And then the next thing, uh, I, I beat someone down on my ship, and you know, I ha I, I split the military, uh, and I was able for 15 years. And um, you know, at the time, I, I you know, I met the Bad Brains uh, when I was in Norfolk, and they were the ones that got me into the whole plant-based thing. 
So when I split, uh, I got a job, uh, you know, I was working for them and started playing music myself and all that. So that's kind of where the whole Cro-Mag thing and, and the plant-based uh, thing came in. And in 82, for two years, I, I joined the Hare Krishnas and lived as a monk. Um, you know, I assumed a fake identity, um, you know. Talk me through that, John. That's such a... Because I would imagine, it, if I'm not mistaken, that was definitely one of the catalysts for the progression of the man that you've become now, the positive mental attitude towards things. Talk me through that time in your life. Well, I mean, I was in, I was in uh, Norfolk uh, in 1980. I went to boot camp and all that. And, um, you know, the thing was, uh, you know, when you don't have a family, you're always looking for, like, what your tribe is, like, where the fuck you fit in. And, and, and uh, th that was always a thing for me. And the first band that came, uh, I think it was, like, March of 80 the teen idols and the untouchables came down ian mckay and the whole henry rollins crew came down there and uh i was just like wow you know i was into like the punk rock shit i was going to clubs in 77 and saw the ramones and you know was into the whole new york punk thing but this was like something different you know um and I was just immediately attracted to it. They were like slam dancing and I was still like pogoing and shit like back in the day. And um, I was like, wow, this shit's fucking crazy. And then I went to like some shows in D.C. because I found out they were up in D.C. And I started really gravitating toward these individuals and this scene and this music. And like they weren't into drugs and which was, I, I didn't give a fuck about that because I was still taking quaaludes and fucking getting fucked up and drinking and I was really a mess, but I was violent. I mean, they, the club, the Taj Mahal, they didn't let any, they didn't, the punk rockers there, the locals didn't like anybody in the military. And, uh, you know, the thing was like, these rednecks came in and, and, and fucked with them and uh, nobody did nothing. And I started smashing chairs over their heads. And uh, and then that's how I got like in with the, you know, all right, well, this guy's cool. We'll let him hang out type situation. And then the bad brains came down and, and I mean, I, they just blew me the fuck away. And the singer, they had this song, Attitude. Don't care what they may say, we got that attitude. Don't care what they may do, we got that attitude. Yeah, we got that PMA. And I'm like, what the fuck is all this PMA shit? And, you know, and then HR was like positive mental attitude. No matter what we go through in life, it's the, it's the attitude that we have that we can overcome anything in this world that we go through. And that just, even back then as a young as we say in the streets of New York, young, dumb, and full of cum motherfucker that I was, it was like, I was like, yo, this something resonated with me, uh, with that, with what I was going through. And uh, HR talked to me a little bit, and then I went up and saw them in D.C., and, uh, you know, HR was like, we're going to see each other again, you know, like, it, it was like this prophetic shit that he was said to me, and then, like, you know, all that shit went down um, with the military and the, and the civilian shit in, in, in Norfolk. And I remember, like, I split. Uh, it was really crazy. Like, when I look at the chain of events that went down, I'm like, there ain't no motherfucking way that that shit was all by accident. Because when I beat that dude down on my ship, I was on lockdown in the ship. And they were going to fucking court martial me. And, uh, the thing was I had gotten, uh, some wisdom teeth pulled and they got really infected. I, I had this really, really bad infection so bad that when we left Puerto Rico and were like out at sea, they had to medevac me off the ship by helicopter back to Roosevelt roads, Puerto Rico. And then they forgot to say that I was fucking supposed to be a prisoner and they gave, they, they, you know, let me just 
you know, when when that cleared the infection, uh, they just they were deciding what the fuck they were gonna do, and um, this was before computers, you see. So there was everything had to be handwritten back then, and um, so they, uh, you know, sent me back to Norfolk because my ship was like, yeah, we're not gonna, um, you know, we're not gonna take them. Uh, back to the ship because they were down by South America. So they like send them back to Norfolk and somehow or another by fate, they forgot to s put in the orders that I was supposed to go to the brig and they gave me my ID and, and the checks and everything. And um, the day, you know, this, this went on for, I was, you know, just going out and partying and doing whatever, just fucking raising hell. And, uh, the guy who ran the, I was in this place called Nimitz Hall, uh, which is like temporary personnel unit, TPU. And they were like, like the day that my ship was coming back, he was like, yo, McGowan, uh, you know, your ship's <laughs> going to be docking in a little while. And I was like, you know, wink, wink. Like they called up over there and said, hold this motherfucker. We're coming to get him. And then like. My, uh, I, I just got my shit together and, you know, fucking ran, uh, to the bus and, uh, it was sooner than later because like, as I was, the, the, the bus was rolling out of the gate cause the, the, the civilian bus went down Hampton Boulevard and then went into the Naval base and turned around and then, and then left. So I got on that bus and as I was rolling out the gate, the fucking master at arms, the two master at arms from my ship were like going, like standing there at the light, like ready to cross the boulevard to Nimitz Hall to come and get me. And I just slunk down in the seat and they didn't see me. And I rolled out the gate, man, and that was it. I never looked back. And uh, after I spent, I don't know, I spent like a week in Norfolk couch surfing and then I went up in, 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 to DC and actually Henry Rollins. Uh, put me up at his house, and after a, a bit of time of you know eating his food and freeloading, he's like, "Yo, it's time to go." And uh, this band called the Undead was playing in D.C. that night, and Bobby Steele was in the original Misfits, and uh, so I was like, "Yo, you going back to New York?" Cause and they were like, "Yeah," and I hitched a hike. I hitchhiked with them, and when I got out of the van on Avenue A. I had like 50 bucks to my name. I didn't know where the fuck I was going, but I just knew my life was going to take a serious turn at that point. And uh, walking down Avenue A, and who do I run into standing in the doorway of the studio, 171A, HR from the Bad Brains. And he was like, Rastafari. And I was just like, Pfft. and that's how the whole situation went down. And um uh, I got in a fight with these gang members that kept fucking with all the punk rockers at this show and at, at all the shows um, that they did at 171A and the Beastie Boys and all them were there and nobody would fight them. And I'm like, yo, let's get these motherfuckers. And the dude who ran the studio, JW, uh, was like, don't fuck with them. They kill people. That's They're, they're a drug gang from Alphabet City and you, you do not want to fuck with them. And... The dude tried to stab me, and uh, I ended up knocking him out. And then I had to fight uh, three, I think it was three or four of his friends, pulled knives and, and tried to stab me. And I got, I used to wear a bike chain, a big-ass chain around my waist. That was the DC thing as a weapon. So I just pulled that shit off and started fighting these motherfuckers. I ended up getting stabbed and... I had to split, and they, they put a, a, a KOS, which is kill on sight, on me. And I couldn't go to Alphabet City. And then finally, uh, I just was like, fuck that. After, like, a couple months of not being able to hang out, I just went down there and faced it. And they, like, surrounded me. And Doc and Daryl ran out from 171A. And, and because they were black, they were able to, like, at least calm the situation for a little while to say like, yo, you know, you tried to stab my man and, you know, and, and 
the way New York was, it's like you could even lose a fight or whatever, but as long as you stood up for yourself, you got respect. If you didn't stand up for yourself, you were just a punk, and people were going to, you know, people were going to fuck with you. That's how it was in lockup, and, and that's how it was most of my life. I was like, after I came out of that foster home, I was like, nobody's putting their fucking hands on me again, and that's it. But it was also, you know, I was looking for something. I didn't know what. I was like very attracted uh, to spirituality. And, and, and then the Bad Brains gave me a job and, 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 and were like, yo, you got to stop eating meat. All of this shit is bringing bad karma and violence to your life and stop doing drugs. And um, they got me a job at a health food store in 81. And I, 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 I went completely uh, raw, raw food uh plant-based and and then started going to yoga and and uh that was that where the evolution of the consciousness kind of began because one of the guys that worked at the health food store was used to go to the krishna temple and then like i would have these philosophical discussions with him and he would just keep like i was reading all these philosophy books but it's like he was able to defeat everything and i'm like where are you getting this information from and he's like you know, Srila Prabhupada is my guru, and uh, here's, uh, you know, let's go to the temple and check it out. And then I was like, you know, went to the temple on, uh, up in Manhattan, and I was like, wow, this is deep. And then he says to me, you know, Krishna is going to show you this is the real deal. And then I was taking, you know, uh, gro- organic groceries to my mom in Queens. Because I, I still, she knew I was AWOL and everything, but I said, hey, you know, that's, that wasn't for me. Like, she understood after everything that we'd been through, uh, you know, that she, you know, I just was fucking confused and didn't know what I was going to do. And she's like, well, the cops showed up at the house a few times looking for you and the military and... And uh, as I'm going out there, I, I, in 74th and Roosevelt, I run into this Hare Krishna dude, and he's like, gives me this book, The Science of Self-Realization. And I read it, and I was like, I go back to the health food store, and I'm like, yo, check out what I got. And the dude, Vinny Signorelli, he's actually the drummer for The Unsane now, but he was in a punk rock band called The Dots, and that was the connection, because... The dude in the dots, Jimmy Quid, produced the first Bad Brain single, Pay to Come and Stay Close to Me. So that was the whole connection between how Vinny Signorelli knew the Bad Brains and gave me a job. And it just all these pieces started fitting together. And the more I started getting around devotees, Hare Krishna devotees, I was like, and seeing how peaceful they were. And how angry and all the rest of the shit that I was, I was like, yo, I got it. I got it take some time off and do some spiritual cleansing. And, and uh, I joined the temple um, in Hawaii and, and then New York. So for two years, I lived as a monk, you know, and and, uh, and then all this crazy shit was going down in the Krishna movement. I found out that they were fucking doing crazy shit uh, against everything that Prabhupada stood for. Humility having no possessions, like just the whole thing. I mean, they were, they were doing fucked up shit. And when I found out, especially the the raping of the children and the schools, just like the Christian religion, and you know, these pedophiles get in these places where kids are and parents trust, oh, they're spiritual. Uh, we trust our kids with them. And guess what? They're the fucking scum of the earth. And, uh, you know, when I started finding out all that shit and then what was done to me, I was like, I'm bringing these motherfuckers down. I'm going to expose them. I don't care for the rest of my life. And I was ostracized by the movement. They, They were like, you're a fucking demon. None of this is true. And then in the last years, it's all come out that, yes, it was true. And, you know, but... This is what I always say. When you know something to be the truth, it don't care if you have a fucking army against you. Just like the Bhagavad Gita was spoken on a battlefield, Arjuna, Krishna, instructed him, no matter what, you have to fight. So 
I, I, I'm always ready for a fight. And, and, you know, when Prabhupada met the Irish devotees, he said, oh, yes, the Irish devotees, you love to fight. <laughs> like, you know, it, 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 I mean, that's, that's uh, part of my nature. But, you know, it's been a long process. Uh, I knew I wasn't healed from the stuff that happened to me as a kid and, and um, shit would set me off. You know, when, when people do shit to you, and it was the dark secret that I had until I wrote The Evolution of a Cro-Magnon. So everything people did to me, I took personal, especially when it was, you know, my band member, uh, Harley fucking, on the first tour in Europe, we were opening up for Motorhead and playing at a, sh you know, sh fucking huge arenas and shit. And he, he stole all the money at the end of the tour. And I was like... And then went on a holiday and like fucking I had to come back to New York on Christmas and, and be broke and lose my apartment. And I was homeless. And I'm like, I was like, what the, f you know, like, how the fuck could this motherfucker do this? And, and um, I quit. The, I smacked the shit out of him first. But then I quit the band and uh, and then I just spun into drug addiction. And for two years, from 88 to 90, I had a, a crack and. Uh, pill and alcohol addiction and, and, and it nearly got me killed uh, I was in a bunch of uh, near death experiences uh, I was robbing drug very violent drug dealers they put KOS's on me uh, down, down in Alphabet City and then I, I went to the west coast I had to split town and then I continued with my shit out there. Like, I started out in a mansion on Pacific Coast Highway with my girlfriend at the time. And, and, and by the end of the year out there, we were living in a crack hotel in fucking Compton. And, and, and like, fucking just everybody after us. Uh, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Like, when newspapers read my book when it came out, they, they thought I made this shit up. It sounds it you it when I delved in and found out about you first and I delved into because when I heard your story first I was like holy shit that sounds like a Hollywood movie and it it doesn't sound real it's your your life is fucking incredible Well you know it, like actually the village voice here in the city uh the guy met with me and he was like oh yeah like uh you know Oh, Rob Harvella or whatever this fucking writer he writes for, you know for, for the Village Voice like music department and at that time all these fake memoirs were coming out like of motherfuckers that claimed like a million little pieces he went on Oprah oh yeah I was in prison and fucking all this shit and then this other like white girl was saying she was a gangbanger and fucking killed people and that so like my book came out when all of this shit was going down and they basically, you know, knew the Cro-Mags kind of had a legendary kind of, you know, underground cult status. And they, the, the dude met me like trying to debunk the book and say, yo, this is bullshit. Come on, man. You made this shit up. And I'm like, motherfucker, like I gave him the, the numbers of my mother and, 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 and family and you know, you could check out everything, and then when he did, it was like, oh, shit, <laughs> you know, all of this shit happened, I mean, I didn't even get into, like, with you, the angel, selling the angel dust, and fucking, I got shot in the leg in Forest Park, and, like, just, you know, but my mother confirmed, like, and she didn't even know I wrote the book at the time, I, did, I kept it from her, um, and she's like, you know, the press, I got this phone call. She's like, the press called me today. Uh, I was like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, about your book. And I was like, yeah, I was going to tell you about that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and she, I was like, so what did you say to the dude? She's, he, he, she said, he started asking me, did this happen? What about this? What about this? And I was like, everything happened. Everything in that book that my son talked about happened. And then they gave me the cover of the Village Voice. And then it just started, uh, you know. But the thing about writing the book, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you because, uh, you know, 
it was a very cleansing process. It took me six years to write the book. Um, and every time I got to the abuse stuff, I would, I would stop and just have a fucking, uh, a meltdown for an hour at my computer sobbing, uh, uncontrollably because you know it was kind of like the shit I never told anybody so and I, I I never I I buried in my in my subconscious like it never happened and then I'm being forced to deal with it and face it and I'll never forget um you know because I went to this writing seminar and, and Robert McKee who wrote story you know, I was adapting the film for the screen at the time, but it was a little fictional. But I was using what happened to me in the in the foster home as, as you know, molding the main character's life out of that. And I asked a question um, during the break. You can ask questions to Mr. McKee. And um, if, if anybody wants to read an amazing book, it's called Story, I would suggest Fucking, if you're a storyteller, and the Irish are, uh, fucking check out this book. And he's the real deal. So I said to him, Mr. McKee, in terms of a protagonist who's been abused as a child, and he stopped me. He's like, listen, he called me McGowan, too. <laughs> he's like, listen, McGowan, he said, um, child abuse is the number one cliche in film these days. And it's because writers have no idea how to develop their characters deeply. So they use this cliche of child abuse to gain sympathy for a character we could otherwise give two shits about. And he said it's not what happens to the character. It's what they do as a result of it. That's the story. And then he wrote in my book when he signed it, always write the truth. And that to me was the light bulb moment in my life where I was like, it's, it, 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 it's what I'm going to do now from this, this point on. Because I was still, as they say, walking on the razor's edge in life. I, I, I wasn't healed of the stuff. And then when I started writing, that gave me the, the courage to, to sit there and be like, this is what happened to me. And uh, when the book came out, it just fucking people were like, holy shit. And, and I, got a le I got a lot of emails from a lot of well-known people that were like, yo, the same thing happened to me. And uh, I'm so glad you had the courage to tell this story. There's a lot of people that's going to be helped by it. And that's why I wrote the book. It wasn't to gain sympathy or, oh, well, you know, you had such a tough life. I don't give a fuck about that because I've always dealt with it on my own. I didn't need anybody's sympathy. If I if I was looking for sympathy, I would have told people back in the fucking 80s what happened to me. I, I wasn't looking for that. I always made my own way in this world, and uh, I never took a fucking hand out. I always worked. I always hustled. I always did whatever I had to do. Um, you know, but, uh, and, and the book has gone on to, it, it, we just finished the second pressing of it. And, uh, I did the audio book. I'm, I'm adapting it for the screen now. Um, you know, I have a director and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's that whole thing in a nutshell. But one of the things that's really helped me to, to heal in a lot of ways is to challenge myself. And that's where the eye. Iron Man and the, and the heavy training in the 80s came from and uh, now Iron Man and, and, and in the gym and, uh, you know, you, you, you know, my guru Prabhupada said every day you have to beat the mind with a stick. And I talk about that in the PMA effect. Uh, your mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy. It's a tool you have to bring under your control. So how do you do that? You know, and like they say, the idle mind is a devil's workshop. And that's fucking true. That's why every day I'm up early, I'm up at it. Every morning I wake up, I touch my head to the, to the, to the floor, and I say my mantras, uh, my Sanskrit mantras, uh, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om, you know, Namo Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Shrimate Bhaktivedanta Swami Nitanamane, uh, my, my Hare Krishnas, and 
and I wake up and I get at it. And it's about action, 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 action. And even, you know, my girl just got on my case yesterday. She's like, you need to start being more, you know, because it's like I'm in the heavy cycle of this Ironman training right now for Florida. And she's like, you're mismanaging your time. You, you, I did something yesterday, interviews and stuff. And I was like, well, that was kind of a waste of time. She's like, yo, like you, you need to. You need to be so fucking strict with your time right now. You got this book coming out. You got an Iron Man. You, you know, my relationship with her, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of stuff to be juggling and then constantly reaching out and trying to help people because that's really what it's about for me. Uh, it's not just uh, my own. Like Prabhupada came to America at 70 years old. Uh, because his spiritual teacher said, go and help people in the West. Now, in his age, he's, he's a sannyas. You're supposed to stay in Vrindavan in, in India and prepare to leave your body meditating and doing all this stuff. Everybody told him he shouldn't go. He's going to die. He had two heart attacks on the way over here on a steamship. Landed in New York with $7 and a case of books. And, you know, that's... What changed my life? If he didn't come here and give this knowledge, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. Even the first Cro-Mag album, Age of Quarrel, was based on his teachings, everything. And I, I, I give credit to Prabhupada because even in my darkest hour, um, I had to leave L.A. I had people fucking trying to kill me out there. I had the fucking FBI after me. The girl who I was with, her parents were like the biggest fucking Hollywood producers. I mean, the, the, her fucking stepfather did the, the Ronald Reagan inaugural ceremony in 84. I mean, the, like this dude had a, the, and then his, her father was a fucking multimillionaire businessman in New York. I mean, it's like I had real motherfuckers after me. And, you know, it was like. I came back to New York and um, this was right right around 90. So it was two years of this insane freebasing crack addiction. And, and um, we ended up selling her car and like all this crazy shit happened, man. It's just fucking like, how the fuck did I get out of that situation? You just keep, and then you just know, yo, you know, Krishna or God or the universe or whatever the hell you want to call it was was definitely looking out for me, man, because like there was so many situations. I mean, there was one situation in Florida where this guy robbed. If you saw the documentary, the cocaine cowboys about the Cubans in, in, in Florida, this guy that I was down there with his brother took a fucking kilo off of the off of these Cubans and didn't pay he robbed them and then we were staying in his house I was staying in his fucking room cuz he left and le left us the house after we freebased didn't tell us yeah I stole his shit from fucking maniacs and guess what the next day they rolled up with two AR15s and fucking emptied clips into the fucking bedroom and the house I mean, bullets missed my, exploded the waterbed and, and, and missed my fucking head by, by fucking centimeters. You know, the cops rolled up, like, how many people died? Like, that type of shit, like, and then coming back, I hit rock bottom. You know, they say when you hit rock bottom, it's, you can always go lower than rock bottom. You could go under the rocks with the fucking maggots and the worms and the decaying fucking corpses and the fucking muck. And that's what I say in my book. You I've can got, go lower got, than rock the bottom. Quote, that's the quote I have right here in front of me. I'm, I'm actually going to read it before you go on because this really struck and landed with me. Um, and, I, and apologies for interrupting, but it's such a powerful yeah, no message. It says, and this is directly from the PMA effect for everybody listening. Some people say that when you hit rock, when you hit bottom, you can only go up from there. That's bullshit. You can always fall lower. You can climb under the rocks with the worms and the maggots and the decaying carcasses. You can climb right into the shit, the muck, the scum, right down to the proverbial hell on earth. Unless, of course, you are willing to change. This 
resonated with me so much because it's something that I've done in my own life where you tell yourself you can't get things can't get worse but they can always get worse I just wanted to read that clip from the book yeah. before you continue because it's so powerful John well you know that's what this whole book is about it's lessons that I've learned and lessons the PMA effect I've picked this the brains of like guys like Rich Roll and friends of mine who are Navy SEALs and fucking Green Berets and, 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 and fucking extreme athletes and people who've also overcome tremendous shit, guys that fucking did 20 years in prison. Like how to, I just did a documentary about that, 30, 30 to Life, with Kip Anderson who did What the Health and Paul DeGelder, the, the Australian Navy SEAL who lost his arm and leg in a, to a fucking bull shark. He wrote the book No Time for Fear. So it's like, you know, you can go lower. And, and, and that's when I realized when I did all that shit on the West Coast and then we got a plane back to New York and she told her neighbor was the fucking heiress to fucking post cereal. Like, and, and they all thought that I was the one that got her into the shit. She was already doing drugs. We would, we just teamed up as fucking partners in crime. We were like, like I said, the Bonnie and Cl the, the crackhead Bonnie and Clyde. And she didn't, she didn't smoke it. She sniffed it. And I, and I smoked, but we sold her car and I'm on a plane. And I mean, I, you know, she said, oh yeah, I told uh, such and such that I was flying back to New York. I was like, the cops are going to be waiting for us at JFK. You just, you just signed the fucking J a, a prison sentence for me because I knew they were looking for us because when we tried to sell the car, the, the fucking her friend that the, the dealership in, in Palm Springs was like, this car's report is stolen and that you kidnapped her and you're fucking AWOL and all of this shit. So I knew like shit was about to go down and, and somehow or another, again, I made it out of, I made her walk in front of me to get in, to, to get into the terminal off the plane. And the minute she entered into the terminal at JFK, just dudes fucking swarmed on her with like, it was raining like crazy and they had like these wet over it was like a scene in a fucking movie man and 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 I escaped and I you know and the and the insane part was I checked my luggage in and I had a fucking ounce of cocaine in the luggage and I was like I'm not going to not go get the luggage so I went down to the carousel and, and fucking had somebody get the luggage for me and they ran outside, the feds ran outside thinking like, okay, I went to go get in the cab. Never in a million years did they think this fucking Mama Luke's going to go get his fucking luggage. But that's <laughs> what I did. And that's, that's how the fuck I got away. Because when I got the luggage and went outside, I got in the fucking cab. And right as we were pulling out, they're like, there he is. And the foot chase was on, but. There's 10,000 cabs pulling out of JFK. Which one was I in? So I got away. And then I went to this crack house, abandoned building, and, and with the coke and the money I had, and, and, and I was freebasing, and, and these motherfuckers hit, hit me uh, in the head with a fucking two-by-four and, and robbed me. I had nothing. I had nothing. And I sat in Tompkins Square Park in the pouring fucking rain, crying. And nobody would be around me because all these drug dealers fucking wanted to kill me. I robbed, you know, I took weed off, like, pounds off of friends of mine and never paid them. And I had nothing. Uh, you know, I was at that place, man. You know, fucking way under the fucking rocks. And I just went to the temple for the Sunday feast. And when I got in the temple room and saw the deities, I just broke down crying and I, uncontrollably. And I said, if you don't let me stay here, I'm going to die. And uh, they let me stay. And uh, the temple president there was, was a friend of mine at the time. And he goes, I know all the shit you, you've been doing because I've been hearing. And you stay here as long as you need and I don't want to throw all the Hare Krishnas under the bus because I'm going to tell you something. 99.9% .9 of them are amazing people who I owe my life to. 
it's that one percent of hierarchy that they've created a pyramid scheme where they exploit the underlings and those are the motherfuckers i have a problem with not the majority of the devotees yeah that um, make, that that so, so, sorry continue you know that's when i started yeah I, that's when i started climbing out of hell i got a job as a bike messenger i mean first i tried to get my friend was like right he was down with the russian mob he's like come to wall street uh, you, you, you're going to make $10,000 a week, you know, so you have to wear a suit. I didn't have a suit. I was broke. So what did I do? <laughs> One of the devotees had a wedding tuxedo and I fucking borrowed a fucking tuxedo with the tails and the ruffle shirt and the bow tie and borrowed this devotee shoes size 13. I'm like a size nine and a half, size 10. I had this stuffed newspaper in the fucking front of the shoes. And I walk into this Wall Street firm. Everybody's wearing fucking Armani suits with a fucking tux, wedding tuxedo. And like <laughs> the whole office just stopped what the fuck they were doing. And we're like, what the fuck? Like, you know, and it wasn't for me. And then I got a job. My friend Chris Flash had a messenger business and I worked for him before and he gave me a job. And that was I needed physical activity. I, 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 that was part of my healing. And people ask me today, how do I stop drinking? How do I stop doing drugs? And the way you do it is by physical activity, man. You fucking, you, you have to fucking get out there and sweat and, and fucking. I was working out. I was bike messengering. I was doing 40 miles, 40 miles a day on the bike and then, ra and then racing at night in Central Park doing the pack ride, hitting the fucking gym, started studying martial arts. I left no time for those negative thoughts to fill my brain. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Crack addiction is a motherfucker because if I would even think about getting high, it, it, it was like in my brain. It was part of my chemistry. I just started getting this rush where I'm like, and I had these temptations of fucking, I, I didn't go to a rehab. I, w I stayed down in the motherfucking thick of it where everybody was selling crack. I'm like, I'm going to beat this shit in the face of the fucking demon. And that's what I did. I had to pay back all the shit, you know, that I, I took from people and, uh, and and make amends with all the people I fucked over. And, and, and that's that's what they tell you in recovery, too. I didn't go to like AA or NA where they tell you, although I unknowingly I was applying all those same principles to, to what I was doing. And that's like asking for forgiveness and, and making amends with people that I burned. And I had to do that, even if it was drug dealers, you know? And then I just climbed out from there. And I got completely sober in, 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 in 1990. And, and that's where I'm at. To, to, to this day, I, I don't even I don't even take a fucking sip of champagne on fucking on, on New Year's because I know like for a little while I had a weed service in New York and um, I was delivering to like Dave Chappelle and all kinds of big time actors and models. It was a very elite delivery service in New York City, like all, you know. Guys who won Academy Awards were fucking calling me up to fucking deliver pot. And that's how I ended up, you know, one of the people I delivered to uh, was Morgan Spurlock, who, 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 who did supersize me. And that's how I met his wife at the time, who I ended up writing the script and the book and everything else with. Uh, well, I wrote the book, but we were working on the movie together. So, um you know, like I, for a period of time there, I started like doing weed brownies and all that shit. And, and then right back, I was like, this is going to lead me back to addiction. And then I just stopped doing all that shit uh, in 2000. And, uh, you know, just to give us a timeline, I, just to give everybody listening a timeline, John, um, how old are you now? I'm, I'm turning 56 uh, next week. Love it, uh, and, uh, and a nearly happy birthday. We were talking about Thank this just you, before Thank we went you. on lawn. October third, nineteen sixty-two. I'm born. Unbelievable, um, John. One of the things I'm curious with, because of the say intensity of Ironman training, because of your background with obviously drugs, alcohol, your life in general, 
it was the allure to Iron Man because of the extremity of the amount of training and physical exertion you have to put in. Is that what pulled you into Iron Man? I mean, it, it's it's uh, that's part of it, but it's it's a mindset. It, it's like I, I need to challenge myself to the utmost, like, and that's what Iron Man. Uh, it, it keeps me focused. I mean, you know, it, it's everybody that does iron. There's people overcoming cancer. There's people overcoming addiction. There's everybody has a story that's involved in the Iron Man community of why would why would you take up a race? And train for it where you have to swim 2.4 miles, bike 112, and then and then run a, a 26.2 mile marathon. I mean, there's everybody has their reason for doing it, and I and I and I had my reason. Um, actually, the first Ironman in, in Cork is is this year. I'm coming signed up. up. Are you doing it? Nah, I would love to, but like, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know. <laughs> I, I think I I prefer to ride and and I'm a little bit of a wimp with the cold man. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you decide, I'm already signed up for it at the end of June. Oh, you're you, amazing, you, man! You, That's may, you are more than welcome to come crash here. Hey, we we hit up together. You, I, I see your last name is Keen, and 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 you know this guy I ran the streets with, and we robbed houses and all this other shit. His name was Joey Keen. You know, and he was from Broad Channel, Queens, and, uh, you know, no his brothers were all <laughs> I don't think. Maniacs, maniacs. I love it. But, yeah, I mean, you know, the Iron Man thing is uh, it's just part of that beating my mind with a stick, uh, you know, daily and staying motivated and, and also to show people, like, I did a thing, Vice did a documentary on me, and I'm like, you know, people say I could never do this, and I'm like, bullshit, motherfucker. You could do anything that you apply yourself to and you take serious. The human spirit can overcome fucking anything, and so many people have proven that. And I'm showing you right now, like, you know, there's people, uh, you know, that these, you know, there's... Um, People that have lost hundreds of pounds, man, and, and do Ironman and run these ultra races. And, I mean, even a guy like Rich Roll with his story, man, it's, you know, it, these guys are all, ha like, have incredible stories uh, of overcoming, you know, David Goggins and all these guys. I, I look to these guys, you know, for inspiration, Um you know, last night I, I I had the fucking train and the night before it, and I'm like, "Fuck, man! It's pouring rain out. You gotta you gotta get at it." Um, like that was one of the things my girl chastised me about. She's like, "You didn't fucking use utilize your time properly today. That's your problem. That's why you're fucking going to the gym, and you have to do this thing at fucking uh, ride." Uh, you know, the fucking bike at, 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 at fucking uh, nine o'clock at night in the pool the other day. But the thing was, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's this woman I know and she's from New York and, and it, I think her thing is always try on Instagram and, and, and um, she lost her leg and she just qualified for Kona again. So she's going back, and she was the first female to ever complete the Kona Ironman course. And it's like, and then I see her training, man, and what she's got to go through on a daily basis. And I'm like, fuck that. I got no fucking room to be a pussy and fucking not do my shit. Look what this person's doing. So it's, you know, we all can inspire each other, man, to do, to do, to do great things, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I just, that's, you know, I, I came up with the concept for this documentary, uh, you know, 30 to Life, and, and we just shot it for a month out west. And it, it really, it's to show even, I mean, these guys were locked up in the worst fucking prisons in America, man. And anybody who knows America knows this is the prison industrial complex, man. They're fucking, we house more motherfucking people in prison because it's a business here. And these guys have done serious fucking time. I mean, only one guy did less than 20 years in prison, and he, and he did 10 years. 
But we wanted him in because of his story. He's, he's, you know, he tried to take his life several times and addicted to drugs, and we wanted his story to be told. Everybody else was over 20 years in places like Pelican Bay and fucking and, and Chino and, and San Quentin and um, with amazing stories. And the healing that they experienced, putting them through what I went through to heal myself, using my journey as a litmus test for these guys. And Paul DeGelder helped me develop it, and, and we took it to Kip, and it got green lit right away. But it's always about paying it forward. If you get a gift, that's what, when people ask Prabhupada, how do I repay you for saving my life? How do you repay somebody for saving your life? You pay it forward. You go and you help the next person in line. And then they help the next person. And people ask me, yo, how the fuck do I, how can I thank you? And I said, pay it forward. I ain't no charge for what I'm telling you. I've sent people books and spent, you know, thousands of dollars. Of, I mean, you know, and, and I don't say this to get brownie points, but I opened up a free yoga center in New York over 10 years, kept it open probably spent a half a million dollars raised the funds for that uh and, and, and it and it helped so many people and that's what it's all about my mother bugged the fuck out she's like you could have a house with with and i said ma just come there and for one sunday feast and see the effect that this place has on people there's a lot of rich motherfuckers like i said on the rich roll podcast that fucking have millions of dollars that are miserable fucking cunts. Excuse my... I hope that, <laughs> yeah, that they're, they're used to me swearing on the podcast. I hope I can get away with that, man. There's certain words these days with the snowflake generation that you can't fucking say. <laughs> you're you're saving up on this podcast. I think I've said worse. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, that's... You know, and, and that's my point is... Yeah, I could have had a house. Big fucking deal. But guess what? Look at what... You know, Prabhupada built a house for the whole world to live in. I don't want to live in some big ass house, me and whoever the fuck. And, and, and when when I can use that same money to to feed the homeless and and keep a yoga center open that's helped thousands of people save their lives from addiction, all kinds of shit. So my mother came for the Sunday feast, and she saw what the place did for everybody. And I never told anybody that I was the one financing the, the, the place or, or did the construction, you know, everything. Built the fucking place with my own two hands for six months. Uh, you know, because it wasn't about getting brownie points. It, 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 you know, God knows what you do, man, good or bad. It's you know, the the pain Krishna, is Krishna's situated in the heart as Paramatma witnessing the Lord in the heart is there, man. I, I, like, you know, I, I don't give two shits w whether somebody believes in God or not. I, I, I have my reasons and, and I have my faith. And, and that faith has been shown to me a million times. You know, there's there's a saying, Te sham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti povakam dinami buddhi yogam tam yena mamu te. By devotion, it's not you demand, oh yeah, show me God. You qualify yourself and Krishna will reveal himself to the devotee through devotional service and love. That's the way it works. So when my mother came to that yoga center, she was like, now I know why you're doing. And she never said that to me again. You know, and she never said like, how could you spend so much money on this place? Like there was times like when I finished the construction, and, and I'm going to tell you something right now. I was down to $2. I had $2 to my name. I couldn't pay. I didn't know. I, I had just spent like $180,000 of money that I had saved. And I'm like, and, and hustling, borrowing money. And because, and, you know, the plumbing contract had to be finished or whatever. And I keep that $2 to this day. It's sitting in my house in a money clip, that same $2. And I kept it because it's all about faith. And it showed me 
Because right after that, all this other stuff started happening in order for me to, 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 to get out of the financial hole that I put myself in. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the journey, but that's what Prabhupada said. You, you, you know, you, the only way you can repay me is, is to help other people to pay it forward. And that's what I try to do, you know, on a daily basis, you know. John, the Gandhi quote comes to mind of lose yourself in the service of others. And uh, your, when I heard your story first, it touched me touched me in ways that you'll never know and unless I tell you directly um it, because it it's got me thinking about parts of my life that I'm like well fuck if John can get through this I can fucking do this and it's going to do that for people that are listening talk to us a little bit about the PMA effect where can people pick it up this is a must like you've everyone that's been listening you've heard John's story and the reason that I was so adamant to get him on the podcast is because this book is going to be life-changing he's not some fucking guru with that you know has had a great life and it's like yeah have a positive mental attitude he's fucking lived nah. it like he's been through the crucible of hell he's been through it and he's out the other side telling you this will make you fucking stronger this will make you a better version of you if you choose the way to look at it you can make your mess your message this book is a must pick up for everybody. John, tell us and I, from the deepest part of my heart, thank you for your time. I know how precious it is. Tell everybody where's the best place to find out more about the book and where can they pick it up? Uh, you can go to the website, the PMA That's uh, T H E P M A E F F E C T. Uh, it comes out uh, October 4th. Uh, it'll be available, um, you know, through Amazon, and I'm sure uh, we'll be figuring out ways to to to, to uh, get it overseas, and and um, you know, it's you know you you know the thing I, I I say is you know you can only remain in neutral, you can only sit on the fence for a little while. In life, you're either gonna go one or two ways, and that's completely up to you. And, you know, I just saw Teddy Atlas on the Joe Rogan podcast and, 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 and the shit that he was saying, it fucking resonated with me because it was all about true character is tested under pressure. And when you put that pressure on and he was talking about, of you know, Mike Tyson and, you know, he, and he, he gave these analogies. Nobody could say they're a doctor because... They went to school and got a doctor. You become a doctor when you step into that emergency room and there's a situation that's not covered in the manuals and you have to pull your shit together and do something outside, thinking outside the box. You're under fucking insane pressure, life and death on the line. That's when you become a doctor. And that's really uh, what it's about. It's, you know... It's a process to develop a mindset is, is, is everything. Your mindset and, and how you walk around in this world, seeing yourself as a fucking victim, or am I going to fucking take charge of my shit and be like, okay, it's time to fucking man up. I'm not going to play the fucking victim card. I'm not going to play the victim role. Oh, woe is me and fucking go fucking soak in a fucking beer in a bar somewhere. I know people that are still telling those stories sitting on a fucking bar stool and that's just not me, you know, and I get inspired by guys like Rich Roll and Brendan Brazier and, 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 and the fucking David Goggins and, and Johnny Mack. I don't know if you heard his fucking story of unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable story. I'm fucking real, man. I, I was like, bro, I want to shake your fucking hand one day, man, and tell you. And, and what is he doing? Now he goes and fucking talks to kids all over the fucking place, man. You know, so it's like when you're put under pressure, it's going to fucking, you know, I, I know a lot of motherfuckers that come on these streets and they're like, they talk a real good game and, you know, they, they have all the sound bites to try to convince people of who the fuck they are. But none of that shit means nothing because when the pressure's on, 
You're going to see the humble motherfucker that never talks shit thrive. And that other dude that's bragging all the time is going to fucking fold like a cheap suit. So the PMA effect, is it, it's broken down into four parts. And each part, like I said, like every limb to the body. And Prabhupada always used this analogy that each limb serves the body. If you sever the limb, it's of no use to the body. And, you know, that's why I broke the book. Everything that I've learned to this point, I, I, I give credit for all of my teachers. Uh, number one is Prabhupada, all, all the people that have helped me. And I say, even, even the homeless wino on the street has taught me lessons. So, you know, the book, I, I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people because uh, it came, you know, I spent four years writing it, didn't talk about it. That's the other thing. You got your talkers and, and, and on the streets, you know, we, we call them flappers. You're always fucking flapping. You're saying you're doing this, you're doing that. Uh... You know, you, you got to be about it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. That's the saying on the street. And that's that's what I did with this book. I didn't say shit until I finished it. And then I was like, told, you know, the people that I'm involved with who put out the last book, like, yo, I got this book. They're like, what? And then as they read it, they were like, holy shit. Like, yo, there's something here, like something serious. And, um, you know, I think, like I said, the book's going to help a lot of people. It's my way of, 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 of getting out there and, and trying to help uh, and try to help people and pay it forward in whatever way I can and say thank you to all my teachers, even the ones that have done me grimy in this life, because in those fucking actions that they took against me, I've learned lessons and I've had to become a better person because of that. And, and I follow... You know, part of the four agreements, which I still deal with daily. You know, uh, the, the book, uh, The Four Agreements by uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of them is don't take things personal. You know, always do your best. Be impeccable with your word and uh, don't make assumptions. And. For a long time, like I, I say it in the PMA effect, I practiced the four disagreements. I fucking did exactly <laughs> the opposite fucking thing. And it got me into mental hells. And now I'm just like when people do shit, I'm like, well, that's their hell that they're projecting. And it's only becomes my truth if I accept it. When people talk shit about me or fucking say whatever or, or do grimy shit. I mean, that's not to say if somebody comes and trying to do some physical shit to me, they're not going to get hemmed up because that's, you know, that goes without saying. But I'm talking about all the other bullshit, you know. You have to let it go, man. We're trying to do big shit over here. And, you know, the dogs may bark, but the elephants have to carry on. And that's, you know, we want to create elephants that just doing magnanimous shit. And if you get bothered by every little fucking thing that somebody does to you on a daily basis and you don't, and, and, and I talk about this, I have a chapter, it, become bulletproof. You have to become bulletproof because motherfuckers are going to be throwing shit at you constantly. And the more shit you do to help others, the more shit people are going to talk about you. Look what they just did to Moby. You know, fucking, he has a restaurant. He's donated a half a million dollars of his own money to help fucking animal charities. And then some fucking asshole writes online that his restaurant's a fucking scam and this and that. And it's like somebody's always, you know, envy runs very deep in this material world. And somebody's, you know, and Joe Rogan brought that up on the podcast. He goes, that's what social media does now. It gives some fucking mama Luke sitting in their mother's basement in St. Louis, the ability to try to take down somebody who's actually out there in the front lines, in the trenches, doing good shit for people. It makes them feel powerful. 
when, how twisted are you that you feel powerful by trying to destroy somebody else that's doing positive shit? How fucked up of a human being do you have to be? But hey, they're out there. So prepare yourself. It's going to happen. So that, that, that's, that's part of the whole trip, you know? I love it. And, for, for everyone. And I, and believe, so, you know, believe me, I still have my moments. And, and my lady's always like, why are you responding to that asshole? Just fucking block him. Just delete him. You know, so it's like you have to surround yourself by positive people, too. Association is everything. And that's my final message is watch who the fuck you hang out with. Watch who you're spending your time with. Because that's going to determine the outcome of, of your personality and your mindset and everything. It's like Goggins says that shit too. Oh, you always surround yourself by people with poopy pants and kicking rocks. Don't worry. It's all going to get better. No, it ain't. It ain't all going to be better unless you man the fuck up. Pull your pants. Like my friend from Belfast always says, pull your fucking pants up and be a man. <laughs> so that's what you have to fucking do. And it's not always going to be okay, you know? And if you surround yourself by enablers like I did and like my brothers did and fucking, you know, that enable you to be a fuck up, you're going to be a fuck up. You need to have people pull your car and say, hey, motherfucker, you're being an asshole. Wake the fuck up. Those are your friends, not the motherfuckers that are like, oh, you're John Joseph from Comex. You can do whatever the fuck you want. It's still cool. It ain't. People called me on my bullshit. That's why I was able to say, well, you know what? You're right. And they still do it. My girl's still pointing out, like, when I'm a fucking fuck up and an asshole. And, and, and don't ever think you're completely healed. In a nice way, though. That's right. In a nice way, though. Brilliant cameo. <laughs> I'm not mean. She's not mean, but... He does the same thing to me. She's a fucking... She's got two black belts. She's a nutritionist. She's done triathlon. She fucking... She, you know, it's like... Uh, she's not going to let me get away with nothing. You know, it's like... That's, that's, that's what it's all about. And if you surround yourself by enablers, you're going to constantly be a fuck-up. You're never going to crawl out from under the rocks. I had people... And my good friend, Ari McGuckin, when nobody would hang out with me, he was the drummer for the Misfits and he was in Antidote. He's an Irish motherfucker. His father's right off the boat. Nobody would hang out with me. And Ari Mac was like, you fucking brought this upon yourself. You fucking man up and you stop being a fucking pussy and doing drugs and feeling sorry for yourself. He's like, listen, McGowan, I know you had it fucking rough. I had it rough, too. And he called me on my bullshit, you know, and, and, and I, I surrounded myself with people that don't let me get away with nothing. And that's what you need to do. And if you surround yourself by a motherfucker, you're, you know, resistance, giving in to the resistance constantly, like the book, The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield, you're going to give in to resistance, you're going to cave in. You know, resistance is always full of shit. It's always lying and completely full of shit. And it's going to con you any way possible if you give that opening in your mind for that resistance to take root and fucking and, and flourish. You're never going to get anywhere. That's why mindset's so important. That's why the PMA effect is so important. It's by applying, it's a science. Right. You have a formula, you apply it, you get a result. And I talk about that even even in, in Meters for Pussies. I'm like, look, this is science. This is biology. This is science. This is physics. This is this is fucking everything. And it's the same thing because the mind can, like I said, could be your best friend or your worst enemy. And you have to you have to fight the resistance. You have to surround yourself by positive people. That, that are doing big shit, you know, over, I have friends that overcame cancer and that, you know, and I'm going to tell you, like when I did, I did Kona world championships, uh, uh, 2016 and 17, and I raced for, um, 
a little boy, um, you know, the Owens family, um, and he's going, he, you know, he has, uh, he, he has neurofibromatosis and it's painful tumors all over his body. And, you know, to see what this young man deals with, uh, Diane and the whole family and, and Justy and, you know, it, it, it just fucking, you know, and the first year I did Kona, my, my friend died basically like right before, the week before, he, he relapsed into drugs and, 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 and fell down a staircase in the subway in New York and, and hit his head and went into a coma and died. Like right before I'm going to do Kona. You know, and, and um, it, it's there's always going to be tests there. There's always going to be tests in life. Those tests are coming. So you prepare yourself by having a strong mindset that I'm not going to cave in. When I get those temptations, it's the association you keep. It's called Bhakta Sangan. You want the association of positive people, of, of people with a positive mindset. And revealing your mind, that's to other people. Hey, man, I'm having these fucked up thoughts. I want to go drink. Uh, you know, I haven't touched fucking alcohol. I, I haven't done any coke. I haven't smoked. Uh, you know, I've been meat free, whatever the fuck. Because that was a big part of my healing. Don't get me wrong. Because I've, I've seen motherfuckers get stabbed to death in front of me, shot, everything. So that resonated with me like, you know, you're trying to live this life, but you're supporting the violence that's conducted towards animals. And I made that, I was able to make that intellectual connection and say, hey man, you know, the Rastaman told me, if, if the man them eat this meat, what you're ingesting Every second of pain that was inflicted upon that animal, you are ingesting that. How could that be good for you? Aital is vital, lotal is fatal. And lotal is the meat, the dairy, the pus, all this shit these people are eating. And then they're wondering why they're sick. So that resonated deeply with me. And that's why I stopped consuming the flesh of, 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 of animals. And, and, and I just... Something just lifted, and, and I talk about it in my book. I'm like, it was like this fucking pressure, this, something just clicked in my consciousness, and I was like, wow. And it ain't no cornball fucking Birkenstock hippie bullshit, you know? Well, my you, aura you, you, claim. you can say I'm what not you want. Them. Yeah, you break up that. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, like you, I'm not, you're that person I'm, that can say it. Sorry, continue. I'm just saying I'm not one of them motherfuckers. I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy to talk about, oh, my aura is being cleansed and fucking, <laughs> you know, all of this other bullshit. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that fucking went through tons of shit and lock up and shot and stabbed and fucking crack addiction. And, and if I was able to overcome all of that shit by this process, the PMA effect, anybody can. And I say that. Because I, I was, I knew that I was going to kill somebody or be killed the way I was going. Because I had it in me. And I'm not bragging about that. That shit scared me. Going to prison for the rest of my life or being killed or, you know. And I knew I had to change, man, and, st and stick with it. So that's what I'm saying. This process could work for anybody. Anybody, and I just proved it with the prisoners that I just worked with. I just proved it with these men who are the hardest motherfuckers you're ever going to meet in your life. And they were brought to tears by this process that somebody gave a fuck about them. And the first time I met them and we got up there and talked to them, one of these brothers that did 20, over 25 years jacked like a motherfucker 
240 pounds of muscle, prison muscle. Broke down fucking crying and had to leave the room. He's like, I can't believe that people care about me enough to come and do this for me. So, you know, like I said, the process works. The science is there. The formula is there. To the degree you apply that formula, you're going to get the result. If you alter the formula, you're altering the result. If you cheapen the formula, you're cheapening the result. That's, that's you know, when Papa said, do everything that I tell you. And do it the right way. And you'll get the result. Prema Bhakti, love of God, love of Krishna. All the anarthas, all the unwanted things, the intoxication, all of that shit. And if anybody wants to read any of his books for free online, you could just go to PrabhupadBooks.com. It's P-R-A-B-H-U-P-A-D-A Books.com. I will definitely link that in the show notes. And yeah. John, I cannot thank you enough for your time. I know with the schedule of the book coming out, you're training for Iron Man, everything else. For everybody listening, everything will be in the show notes. The link, the book will ship overseas. I've already ordered my copy. It's coming on the 4th. We're recording this on the 26th of September and the episode is live on the 13th. So it is out now. So you can go order the PMA Effect. Um, you definitely, I'm not sure through the website, but through Amazon, you can definitely get it shipped to Ireland. Yeah. John, thank you so much for your time, thank for you, your story man. and for sharing. Listen, anytime I get to get up at 6.30 in the morning and hear a sexy Irish brogue, <laughs> it's a good fucking day, man. <laughs> well, kicking it off in style. John, Joseph, <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, much love, brother. Peace. Quick message before you head off. Just letting you know my best-selling book, The Fitness Mindset, is now available on Audible and all major audiobook apps. If you're like me and love listening to books while you travel or work out, be sure to go to audible.co.uk or audible.com to check out the audio version of The Fitness Mindset. You can listen to a three-minute sample on there or you can download the full book. Also, last thing before you leave, if you try Clean Cut Meals, the sponsors of today's episode, be sure to enter the code BKF at the checkout to get your 20% off your first order. Clean Cup Meals are doing all my food for my next adventure challenge coming early next year. I'll be announcing more about that during next month's podcast and I'm just waiting, I'm just waiting actually on medical clearance, Ugh, yikes. Um, so stay tuned for that and remember code BKF at the checkout for 20% off your first order. Catch you all next week.